this is a story of darkness and greed. Of what happens when nothing gets in the way of the pursuit of money, not even love. Devastating. Devastating. It was your worst nightmare. On a modest and tranquil estate on the northern fringes of London, a couple are bringing up two young children. But forces are at work which will shatter their world and their chance of future happiness. Right from the start, Sharon from Barnet in Hertfordshire stood out as a star. Aged 14, she was learning karate and heading for the top of the class. Little did she know it was to change her life. She caught the eye of the trainer, Gary, a fifth Dan black belt and secretary of the Karate Club of Great Britain. Sharon didn't really go in for anything unless she thought she could be the best. Also in the karate class, Sharon's best friend from school, Paula. Paula was always in Sharon's life, really, from very tiny right the way through. They'd been through the same schools. Gary started his working life as a jeweller and was separated from his wife. And though Sharon was only half his age, Gary began a relationship with her. He invited her on a karate trip to Canada. Then her parents learned the only person Gary was taking was Sharon. What do you do? Sharon was coming up for 16. Do you turn around and try and put a block on them and say, no, you're not gonna do this, you're not gonna do that. And maybe them turn around and say, well, on your bike, I'm going, and breaking the family up completely. There was something not, not right. I was at a loss to see the attraction of somebody with such a huge age gap. You have to bite your tongue and say, yes, but not to, uh, if you're gonna do it, you're gonna have to fund yourself and make them sort of realise that they've got to pay for it. But uh, it was very, very hard, very, very difficult. But Sharon was flying high. Gary helped her achieve second place in the 1989 World Karate Championships. She qualified as a swimming instructor and won a first-class degree in maths. In 1993, when she was 22, she and Gary got married, but her family still had reservations. It was as if I was at a wedding of strangers in many respects. He wasn't somebody that I could warm to at all. <laughs> but Sharon loved Gary. By the late 90s, the couple had two young sons and were living in a three-bedroomed former council house in Hertfordshire. Gary also had a teenage son from his first marriage, who lived with his former wife. Sharon was working as a research officer, but the young family was not destined to be happy for long. Soon, every aspect of their life would need to be examined by the Metropolitan Police. We're now on the estate where Gary and Sharon set up their last home together. Quite a quiet estate. But for Gary, a quiet life on an ordinary estate wasn't on the agenda, nor was a steady job. I always looked at Gary and I thought, he's a typical South London Arthur Daly. Gary had found a quick route to the visible trappings of status and success, wheeler dealing. Gary had made a lot of um, alterations to the house, extensions, even putting the, the dojo and the gymnasium in, in the premises. He was very keen to get a swimming pool built in the back garden, and the swimming pool actually dwarfed uh, the garden and, and filled most of it. He'd made himself into what can only describe as a 1960s type gangster character. 
larger than life. He wanted everybody to think that here he was, this big, I am big wheeler dealer. I think with Gary, you can sum it up as cash not class. He couldn't see the value in small things, unless they were diamonds. He was financing this lifestyle through a new career. These were the early days of internet trading, and from a converted loft, he bought and sold highly valuable rare and vintage guitars, building a huge collection. And he wanted to make a show of that to, to his friends, that uh, this is how, how wealthy and how successful a person he was. Soon, his guitar collection was worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. At one time, Gary went to America with a guitar, and apparently he paid for a seat for the guitar rather than have it put in the hold. So uh, it sort of gave me some idea of what the value of these things really turned out to be. But behind the scenes, Gary was in financial straits. Twice he claimed guitars had been stolen and received insurance payouts in six figures. He was secretive about his dealings. He was a man who liked to control things and he wouldn't even let his wife in the uh, office. Uh, so she had no great knowledge of what was happening there. Increasingly, tensions began to appear in his relationship with Sharon. All Gary wanted to do was to stay indoors and not go out so much. And Sharon, obviously, wanted to go out, but then didn't feel that she should go out. A deeper source of tension was over work and money. For all that Gary loved to flash cash around, he had no regular job. He had this way, he had this ability to, to get people to do everything for him. Sharon was working full time. She was thinking of the future for herself and her two small boys. She began to put pressure on Gary to get a job. Gary, for some reason, thought that it was a mug's game to work for somebody else. I think the fact that Gary never held down a permanent job, which um, gave a regular income, Sharon had a very, very strong feeling about that. So strong that the couple split, deepening an increasingly dangerous divide. Hello, guys. It's going to be In the summer of 1999, Sharon took the boys and went back to live with her father. Okay. For her parents, it was a blessing because her mother was in the terminal phase of cancer. It lifted Betty a little bit to think that Sharon was there and Sharon was able to sit with her and talk. The fact that Sharon was here was a tower of strength for me. I knew that Mum was being looked after. Sharon also decided to retrain as a teacher. She found a job as a trainee with a nearby school starting in the new school year. She felt that September was the start of a new life. It was certainly a new chapter in her life. But her mother's condition was growing worse. Gary kindly eased her pain with Shiatsu Chinese muscle massage. Sharon would cry and say, you know, what's happened to mum? And I, I used to say, you know, put my arm around her or give her a cuddle and say, look, it's not mum there anymore. Your mum's gone. The cancer had hit the brain. In August 1999, Betty died. The following month, 29-year-old Sharon started her postgraduate teacher training. She was planning a new life without Gary though if she divorced him, she'd need a payout to cover her future with the boys. But little did she know that whilst she was preparing for life as a single parent, Gary had begun a new relationship with none other than Sharon's best friend from school and the karate classes, Paula. It had a long friendship with Paula, but it developed into much more while Sharon was away. An affair started. Um, in September or October of 99. But Gary was a man under stress. His marriage was on the rocks and he felt the looming divorce payment would bring disaster. 
although on the face of it he was a successful man living in a substantial property with his guitar collection, he was actually in tremendous amount of debt. He'd got credit card debts that were well in excess of £100,000 and he was in trouble, he knew it, and was under tremendous pressure. But Sharon was in the dark and she was about to make a decision that would shatter her family forever. Sharon, a trainee teacher and mother of two small sons, had left her husband Gary after a series of rows and moved in with her father. Gary was out of work, massively overdrawn and was having a secret affair with his wife's close friend, Paula. Sharon was about to hit him where it hurt. In the autumn of 1999, it's clear that Sharon and Gary had discussed divorce. Figures that were involved are, are, are incredible because Sharon had been offered by Gary a settlement in the region of £45,000, which was an absolute pittance. When you consider that there was the family home that could be sold, valued around £400,000, and this really expensive guitar collection. She confided in friends that this is what the figure that she was being offered. She also confided in her solicitor, and solicitor and friends all urged her in the strongest terms to seek more than that, something in the, in the region of £100,000 as a decent settlement. It's clear that Sharon told Gary, again in very strong terms, that he ought to auction some or all of his guitar collection to help meet that payment to her. I made you an offer, that's all you'll get. But Gary refused point blank to sell off his sacred guitar collection to provide money for Sharon and his sons. Gary is a very possessive person. What he has is his. What he has he wants to own. He won't part with anything. He would have fought it tooth and nail. Police allege Gary concocted a plan to make sure that if Sharon took him to court, she'd win no sympathy. Gary was very concerned to limit the amount of money that he would eventually have to pay Sharon in, uh, for the divorce. And he went very, very devious to do all that he could to blacken Sharon's name. Gary at one point instructed a private detective to try and catch his wife, allegedly with men. It was the ultimate betrayal. He used Sharon's close friend Paula, with whom he himself was having a secret affair, to try to prove his wife's infidelity. The plan was that Paula, his girlfriend, took um, Sharon to various local clubs and pubs trying to find a boyfriend that would be witnessed by the private detective. This wasn't successful, um, and part of the other means of trying to blacken her name was to tell friends and associates locally that she was selling drugs and also buying drugs. Again, this was never proven. In October 1999, at half term, and possibly because she too was manoeuvring for the pending divorce, Sharon made perhaps the most dangerous decision of her life. She decided to leave her father's house and move back in with Gary. She did it without telling her father and whilst he was away. Things went badly from the start. As she and Gary shifted the boys' bunk beds out of her father's house, she had a fall. Apparently, uh, Sharon had slipped, hit her head at the bottom of the stairs and had to go to the hospital. Did she slip or, or, or what? Sharon had made the decision to move back with Gary after consulting her solicitor. I believe she was told that it would be better if she was in the matrimonial home before she started divorce proceedings. It's far easier for the wife to keep the house and the children if she's actually there, whereas it would be very difficult to move back in once she started the proceedings. The last weekend in November 1999, Sharon had a big day coming up on the Monday, a teacher's inset training session. She'd taken home 40 exercise books. Her aunt Janet, a teacher herself, rang her on the Saturday night. I said, how about the marking? She said, I have piles of it. 
possible, I did warn you. But in the same conversation, Sharon spoke to Janet's daughter, Sandra. She indicated something had happened to set Gary off. She repeated she wanted a divorce. The next day, the family visited a neighbour's house. Sharon and Gary went for um, a bit of tea with the neighbours and took the children. Uh, during that uh, tea, there was uh, some degree of um, upset and uh, tension. I'll bring the money in, do Afterwards, she came out on the, to this green uh, where she was flying a kite with the children. Strange at that time of year because it's obviously quite dark. The, um, the last thing we do know about uh, Sharon is that she had a telephone conversation a little bit later on with her childminder in regard to childcare over the next few days. Yeah, see you next week. Take care. Bye. But the childminder never saw Sharon again. Nor, the next day, was there any sign of Sharon at the school where she was expected for teacher training. There was a clear problem. Sharon hadn't arrived at a school in Hoddesdon that she was teaching at. She hadn't told the school she wouldn't be coming. Relatives hadn't heard from Sharon. And a number of them became very concerned about her welfare. That Monday afternoon, Sandra, Sharon's cousin, called at the house. She said, Mum, I've got a terrible feeling. She said, Sharon wasn't there. I said, what do you mean Sharon wasn't there? She said, I got there and nobody was there. And then Gary came with the boys from the neighbours and said that Sharon wasn't there. Sharon hadn't come home. Gary telephoned Sharon's father. Gary rang and said, that, uh, was Sharon here? I said, no, I said, isn't she at home? He said, no, she went out and she hasn't come back. He said she'd gone to stay with friends in her maths group, taking her workbooks to prepare for the teacher training. It was a f sort of funny, the way it came across, it was as though, oh well, it, was, it was, came across quite matter of fact. Gary didn't call the police to report his wife missing until two days after the disappearance. On the Thursday, with still no news, Sandra called again. When she got there, Gary said, no, she's not here. She's not. And he said, come and see. And he insisted that she went in and he took her round to show her through the house to prove that Sharon wasn't there. There was no sign of Sharon, but Sandra did notice some of the wallpaper next to the bed had been stripped. He said, she's left. And, and that was the beginning of the nightmare, basically. At about this time, Harry called the police to say there was no sign of Sharon. I phoned them up, which was... Uh... Quite a shock, really. It's so matter of fact. Uh, and their answer was, well, she's over 18. She's every right to go missing if she wants to. Um, most missing people turn up within the first six weeks. 80% come back within that time. Um, and we don't really take a lot of notice until after that period of time. Which is a bit of a, um, a kick in the teeth when you're worried. Gary told police he thought Sharon was with another man, but her family couldn't understand why she'd walk out on the boys she loved. And this was the run-up to the millennium. She'd been feeling her own life was swept up in the excitement. The sense a fresh start was possible. She was in the middle of a teaching practice. It was important. This was the rest of her life she was organising. Life was beginning to look really good, really positive again 
for her. It was going to be a, a new century and a new start, was what she said. I started then to think that she had a breakdown, had I missed something. For Harry, Sharon's disappearance was a blow which came only three months after the death of his wife. You get the guilt feeling, and I did have the guilt feeling that I hadn't paid him as much attention as I should have done. Had I been wrapped up in my own grief, not to notice anything with Sharon. Um, and you get into the self-blame procedure within yourself. All I did once the first, after the first four or five days was sit in the conservatory looking at the front door and just waiting for somebody to walk up to it. You feel that they might be on the street, you even get to the stage where, and I did, that I'd even got my coat on and was going to walk out the door. I was going to go up King's Cross and Euston and just see whether she was on, on with the down and outs. But you get to the front door and then you realise that what chance have you got of finding one person in London where you might, she might not even be there? I suppose we knew that something awful had happened somewhere along the line. The month after the disappearance, police finally had a breakthrough. Sharon's car was discovered. The car was found here in this small, quiet street. Um, it's only about half a mile from where they live. That was the beginning of the really, really low point. Up until then, I'd maintained that Sharon had... It may seem funny or silly, but in my own mind, I thought, well, at least she's got the car, she's got means of coming home. When the car was found, then I thought she was on her own and in a very, very difficult position. Um, and that's when I got some of my blackest thoughts of what could have happened, that she could have been abducted or something like that. Gary had told police Sharon had had her phone with her. An officer checked the glove compartment to see if the phone was there. Then the car was given back to Gary. The local CID were informed and they then wished to retrieve the vehicle for forensic examination. A period of probably a couple of hours had passed by this point. When detectives got the car back, they found it had been cleaned and vacuumed. The reason it had been cleaned must signify that something had happened, but your mind then shuts down because you don't really want to know. I'd had a bad feeling from the word go when she disappeared. Now uh, the car was found, it was beginning to realise my worst nightmare. The officer who had previously searched the glove compartment found its contents altered. And there were some items that weren't in there before. And they consisted of a, a, like a child's plastic beaker, had some white powder on it, there was a map book, a couple of source-type containers, and two Durexes. And whether that is part of the story to continue, continue the myth that Sharon was um, a naughty girl and um, had been planning to escape with, from Gary with another man, I, we, we don't know, but it didn't appear correct at the time. Spots of blood were found in the boot. The house was searched, and more spots were found in the martial arts room. Gary had an explanation. He said he and Sharon had been play fighting. He said that Sharon had had a nosebleed, and in relation to the blood that was in the boot of the car, he said that um, Sharon had caught her hand on a, a baby's pushchair. But in both respects, the blood was in, in sufficient quantity to make it suspicious. In Gary's loft, police found the expensive guitars, and there were further discoveries. During the search, it was also noted that the bedroom had been redecorated. The search then uh, moved on to the gymnasium, and in there, uh, a number of books, possibly 30 school books, were discovered. These were the books that Sharon 
uh, is alleged to have taken with her when she disappeared that night to have marked at the inset day the next day. But there was no hard evidence of foul play. A month after the 29-year-old's disappearance, it was still a mystery, a missing person inquiry. Gary was prepared to make a TV appeal uh, begging her to return home uh, and that's the extent of um, his desire to show that she was still alive and that he believed that she was still alive. Police received a new lead. Paula, Gary's lover, claimed a month before her disappearance Sharon had given her a jiffy bag for safekeeping. It allegedly contained drugs, cash and a passport, effectively an escape kit. Paula told police that on the night of Sharon's disappearance, she'd had a phone call from Sharon asking to meet up. The rendezvous was in a dark lane, and Paula arrived first and waited. Eventually, Sharon arrived. Sharon had been in her own car. They spoke very briefly, and she appeared to be upset. And in the car was a male unknown to Paula. Uh, I'll phone you, let you know what's going on. Call me. That was the last time she saw Sharon. Although Paula's story diverted police attention for a time, Gary was increasingly feeling under scrutiny. Her story, which we had to investigate, effectively brought Gary some real time in making preparations to a counter a police investigation, which he was obviously then very, very worried about. Police uh, investigations were revealing his lifestyle, the fact that um, he had a motive in the form of uh, this divorce settlement, uh, which was completely against the grain with Gary, uh, parting with the money from his guitars. And um, various friends were actually talking to police, and that was worrying him. Gary was cornered and about to take a desperate gamble to throw the police off track. For wheeler dealer Gary, the heat was on. His wife Sharon had disappeared in November 1999 and detectives were closing in. They discovered the couple had argued over the amount he should pay her in a divorce settlement. In January 2000, the pressure became too much. Next thing that happened was all of a sudden, no notice, no warning. Gary hired a van, packed it with some of his precious guitars and some of those guitars he'd been paid out on in this um, false insurance fraud, put his two boys in the van and drove to Spain. Um, this was a moonlight flip, no other word for it. Gary being Gary wasn't content with the image of a Ford Transit, he wanted a top of the range van from a local hire company but um, it was um, paid for on what we call a bounce check, I had checked with no funds. Paula was left back in England. On the way to Spain, Gary posted a series of letters. He wrote that he was at risk if he remained in the UK and alleged Sharon had been in trouble with a gang over an unpaid debt and that she had a boyfriend. I really did not believe any of it at all. I just thought, He'd got himself in a little world of his own. He was in this fantasy world if he thought that that's what was going on. In February 2000, Interpol found Gary's van. Detective Laurie Roach went to Spain to collect it. But under extradition arrangements at the time, Gary couldn't be brought back to Britain or even questioned without a warrant. But Gary's departure transformed the investigation from a missing person into a potential murder case, and detectives expanded their search for Sharon's body. The area that I'm bringing to now is um, a very, very strange place. It's referred to locally as the Swallow Holes, um, and it's quite a vast area of wetlands. Now, this area is one of only six in the world, and it's a system of um, underground limestone holes, basically, which are covered in uh, silty-type mud. After Gary's disappearance to Spain, we began to search local areas 
a possible site where a body could have been um, laid down or buried. This is in, within a couple of miles of the house. There's various areas come up where vortexes appear and objects can be placed in those, in those vortexes and they drift down through the watercourse system. Police found nothing, but evidence was about to emerge which would confirm Sharon had not abandoned her two young sons. As a father, you never will allow yourself to believe the unmentionable. The whole idea of somebody killing somebody else is so out of a, what I would call a normal mindset. Um, I couldn't even think for one minute that somebody had killed her. On the estate of an Elizabethan mansion near the couple's house in late March 2000, a grim discovery was made. This is North Hims Park in Wellham Green, and it's here that a falconer flying his falcon discovered the body of Sharon. Her body was found amongst debris in a watercourse, which is covered by woodland. The body was examined by myself, and it was unrecognisable, uh, mainly due to the weather conditions and exposure. Uh, medical examinations revealed that it was the body of Sharon. I just broke down and cried. <laughs> That's all you can say. I just completely and utterly shattered because until then and, and while a person is missing they're not dead and no matter what the circumstances and how people think and everybody says oh yeah but you must have known you must have known yeah you most likely did know in your heart of hearts but uh, your brain won't let you accept that Devastating. Devastating. Just... It was your worst nightmare. The cause of injury was given as blunt trauma injury to the base of the head, and that's caused by a ball pain hammer. Police instinct had been close to the mark. The spot is directly downstream from the swallow holes searched earlier. This is a watercourse flowing north. Uh, the tunnels in the distance take it onto the private estate. It's dry at the moment, but when the rain has built up, it can be very, very fast water. A pathologist found multiple fractures to the face, jaw and back of the head. What the pathologist was also able to say was that the blood hadn't drained to a particular part of the body, and he could uh, tell from that that uh, Sharon's body had been disposed of or secreted very soon after death. Police needed to know where the body could have been hidden, so they searched upstream from where it was found. The, uh... The only place we could find was under the culvert, under the uh, A1 motorway, because it was dry and it was concealed. If this was the place, police needed to find who'd been in the vicinity on the night of the killing. They examined mobile phone records. We got telephone records that showed that Gary was in an area close to that culvert by the side of the main road for as long as three hours on that Sunday night and that during that time he'd made numerous telephone calls to Paula and to his son Gareth. Records showed that later that night Paula too had been in the area for about 20 minutes. Gary couldn't be questioned because he was in Spain. He later claimed his presence at the spot was purely coincidental but Paula was interviewed and had an explanation. Gary had been out cycling, had got a puncture and had fallen from the bike and that he'd rung Paula asking for some bandages and a puncture repair kit 
and that she travelled out to that location to meet Gary and give him that assistance. Paula claimed she arranged to meet Gary beside a footbridge over the A1, on the other side of which lies the culvert. It's at this point on the entrance to the footpath that um, Paula says she finds Gary and where she administers first aid in the form of a plaster and a glass of water. Gary also claimed some of the phone calls between himself, Gareth and Paula were because he was trying to get her to collect Gareth from the London Eye, at the time a novelty in the run-up to its opening on Millennium Eve, and give Gareth a lift home. He said Paula had gone to fetch him. She'd dropped Gareth at the end of Gary's road and gone home. Mobile phone evidence does show that Gareth was at Gary's house for two hours that night. The police version of what happened that evening is very different. This is what we believe happens in this case, that Gary, for the first time in his life, has actually been challenged by someone, in this case his wife, Sharon. Um, he painted a picture, assisted by Paula, to show that she was dealing with drugs, had boyfriends. This was not the case at all. Something happened, something to do with the divorce, something to do with money, but something that Sharon said to Gary made Gary absolutely snap. <laughs> Gary lost his temper and in that bedroom struck Sharon some fierce blows with a a heavy instrument, which was probably a hammer, and then took every step he could to cover his tracks. One of those steps would involved removing the wallpaper from the bedroom walls. This would explain the state of the bedroom as witnessed by Sharon's cousin, Sandra. Gary's son, Gareth, subsequently confirmed taking two bin bags, allegedly filled with paper, to an uncle's house, south of the Thames. But he said this was some weeks earlier, and that the bags contained documents relating to the investigation by the private detective. Gary took his wife's body to an area of woodland near to the A1. The body was then concealed with the assistance of Paula in a culvert, where it was later moved through the stream systems into the place where it was found by the man on the private estate. Piecing together a scenario for the murder was one thing. Picking up the trail of Gary in Spain and getting him to court was another. When he'd arrived at Fuenjirola on the Costa del Sol, he'd initially moved in with an old girlfriend. He went and um, stayed with her for a few days, which ended up being a few weeks, um, given her the explanation that the police were putting pressure on him because his wife had gone missing and that she was um, a bad, bad lady, well, well known in the area for, as a drugs dealer. He then moved on to other apartments and placed his children in local schools. He didn't come back to the UK for Sharon's funeral or memorial service. Though many were by now convinced of Gary's guilt over Sharon's death, Harry still couldn't accept it. Partly because of the kindness Gary had shown to Harry's wife when she was dying. Although he had a very, very flary temper, he was normally very cool, calm, collective, and very understanding person. He'd given no end of help and hope to Betty during her illness. And I just couldn't at that time imagine that he was capable of doing that. A year after the murder, Harry flew out to see him and take Christmas presents to the boys. I couldn't believe that Gary would have done that to them. My whole belief was that if he's done it, then the boys have got nothing. He couldn't have done it. It was a sort of complete and utter denial that he would have done such a thing to the boys. But Gary's demeanour in Spain changed his mind. It was all poor Gary, not poor boys, they've got no mum, not 
What are the police doing to find the killer? All of a sudden, it all hit me. And I literally, well, I virtually cried all the way home. He was involved in what had happened to Sharon. Gary sold the family home from Spain via his older son, Gareth. But he was running out of guitars, running out of money. Finally, his time ran out too. Spanish police arrested him. Whilst awaiting the extradition in Madrid prison, Gary got married to a local UK resident who had, had been living in Spain and he'd been living with. Uh, this delayed the proceedings. Eventually, I went out to uh, Madrid and he was formally arrested and brought back to this country. The old Bailey was waiting. Gary, the wheeler dealer who'd been on the run in Spain, had finally been extradited back to the UK. But it wasn't only for the murder of his wife Sharon that he'd faced justice. Insurers who'd paid out half a million pounds over the allegedly stolen guitars sued him and won. They took some of the guitars in compensation, others were given to Gary's family. In 2004, Gary pleaded not guilty to murder in his preliminary hearing at Hendon Magistrates Court. In his full trial at the Old Bailey in March 2005, Gary again denied murder. His son Gareth denied assisting an offender and intending to pervert the course of justice. Gary's lover and Sharon's friend Paula denied two counts of assisting an offender and one of intending to pervert the course of justice. But she confessed to a similar charge over the story about the jiffy bag. She said it was an alibi made up by Gary. The defense said there was no forensic evidence that Gary had murdered his wife, Sharon. But the jury found the circumstantial evidence overwhelming. The stripped wallpaper. Gary's three hours on the night of the murder at the spot where the body had been dumped. His flit to Spain. Gary was found guilty and sentenced to life with a minimum of 18 years in prison. Gary's son Gareth was cleared and the jury failed to reach a verdict on whether Paula had helped Gary, though she was given an eight-month suspended sentence and ordered to pay £1,000 costs for perverting the course of justice by lying to give Gary an alibi. Gary appealed, but only managed to reduce his minimum sentence by two years. A decade on, Harry is left with the pieces that remain when nightmare descends upon ordinary lives. I've still got three boxes of Sharon's belongings or household things that are in the garage. Just can't bring myself to get rid of them just yet. There's no real significance, it's just the fact that they are boxes ready for her to start up a, a new house that she was going to be moving into once everything was settled after the divorce. I can't bring myself to get rid of just yet. It will come, but um, what do you do? It's part of Sharon, unfortunately. And you never forget and you never want to forget. That's really all it is. It's part of her life and part of my memories of her. The thing with Gary that sticks in my mind was he had absolutely no remorse for the actions he took against his wife. Sharon's ashes were scattered at a local crematorium alongside her mother's. The family has so far left her resting place unmarked. It's now time really to think for the boys and uh, see whether they want to put stones and uh, a memorial, a memorial and, put and, put, and enter it into the book of remembrance. Yes. She really did no harm to him. Perhaps his ego. Um, that she wanted to leave. I think Gary was a very, very devious, calculating man. Uh, I think he was 
tremendously materialistic. And I think that was at the root of, of the problem, the money, um, that's what made him do what he did. And I think that it was, uh, he did everything he could, not only to cover his tracks, but to blacken the name of Sharon. And I think Sharon was a lovely lady and a very, very loyal and good friend and an excellent mother to her children. People sort of said, oh, don't you hate him? Don't you do this? Don't you do that? And I said, Gary really and truly is a non-entity. He doesn't come into it. It's only the children. He's an object, a non-entity. This is really what I can't come to terms with, that she oh, should no, no, not no. have been here. <laughs> yeah. 29 years. Whatever happened to the four score years and 10? ten? Yeah, well. Or even three score years and 10, ten would yeah. have been a bonus. Life's sacred. If she'd lost her life in a war, you'd have grieved. You'd have seen the bigger picture, but okay. money's not the bigger picture. Never. Yeah. Never. I guess you're not.